Well, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about staying in, uh, the God, in God's rest. And um, I want to cover some things specifically related that, to that tonight. And uh, I'm going to talk about something specific in that area. Let's look at Matthew 11, verse 28. It says, come to me, this is Jesus speaking, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we, a, a yoke, of course, a yoke is meant to... Um, help or bring two animals together, you know, if, if there's two oxen or two mules, horses, it, it brings them together, put it over, uh, you know, their neck and that torso or that uh, shoulder area so that they can pull as one. They can pull a load as one so that they can move along and do work as one. So this is saying, um, it's talk, Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. If you go back to verse 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So if we're striving, if we're pushing, if we're burdened down, he said, come to me. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. So you know you, you, know you can have different yokes in life. You can take different things upon you that aren't necessarily him. We're going to talk about something specific in that area tonight. But you can take different yokes on you, but he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So if you're taking his yoke upon you, he's next to you. He's pulling with you. He's, he's, you're walking with him. Okay, it's not just a figurative, well, take my yoke as if he's just handed you something. That means he's with you. He's pulling with you. So he said, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. This is the God of the universe saying this. And you will find rest for your souls. Notice he's saying you take something on you, but it's not a burdensome yoke. You'll actually find rest in that yoke. Not the, so that's not what the, the world will put yokes on you, and they won't be restful. They'll weigh you down, which is why he starts out saying all that all the you that are uh, labor are you labor and are heavy laden. Verse 30 says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke, Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Let's read this in the Amplified Classic. I love this in the Amplified Classic. Verse 28 says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your soul. So these things are in Jesus. Relief, refreshing, true refreshing. They're only in the Christ. They're only in Jesus. You can get some fake refreshing, fake, fake relief from all kinds of sources in the world. You know, maybe, maybe a pill, maybe a bottle, maybe other things, activities. What? But but they're not lasting like this. They they. Uh, the, his rest transcends everything that we'll face in life. It actually, actually does ease and give us rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble, or lowly in heart, and you will find rest, relief, and ease, and refreshment, and recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls. Again, it's only in Jesus. He is the true source. Verse 30, for my yoke is wholesome, it's useful, it's good, not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing, but comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to be borne. So what the Christ gives you his yoke, his burden, it's easy to be born. Everybody say easy. So it's not straining. See, this goes against religion. A lot of time religion is like, well, you just got to, you got to really strain for God. Otherwise, you're not serious. 
This is Jesus saying, nope, if you're coming to me, and number one, if you are straining, come to me. If you're overburdened, come to me, and I'm going to actually give you rest, and then take my yoke upon you, and then it's going to be light, and it's going to be easy. That's what Jesus said. So there are a lot of counterfeits. There are a lot of ideas out there uh, in the world that will actually put you into bondage, will actually put you under a yoke that you cannot bear. Now, they'll, they'll promise rest. They'll promise peace, but it doesn't actually, they don't deliver. But, but Jesus, he is who he said he is, and he does what he said uh, that he will do. And so we looked at this last week. It's in Psalm 127, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Uh, it's, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house. So who's building the house? The Lord. And what, what would we, figuratively, when we're talking about what we do in life, it's, it's, that's the house. When we're talking about a house here, it's, it's his plan. What are we doing with our life? And unless the Lord is building it, it says the, the builders, they labor in vain who build it. Notice that they're building something, but it's in vain because God wasn't in it. So it's important if he's the one that's directing, number one, it's going to be easy, and that's the only way it's going to be truly worth something when everything settles. Now let's look at Colossians 3.22. I want to talk to you specifically about other people's expectations as it relates to this. Because our burden is supposed to be easy and light. And um, it, we're supposed to be hooked up with what he's doing. Okay? Not what other, somebody else thinks we're supposed to do. Verse 22, it says, bond servants. And now this is talking about people that were actually sold. Bond servant meant somebody that was willingly a slave for somebody else, but they, you know, um, became a slave on uh, willingly because they they liked who they were. But you could say today, employees, people that work for somebody else, when it when in context here, but that's not really the focus. But just clarifying that, bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers but since but in sincerity of heart fearing god or reverencing god verse 23 and whatever you do do it heartily as to the lord and not to men knowing that from the lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the lord christ so this is saying if you go back let's just read 22 again now, we're talking about his yoke being easy, his burden being light, um, that it's restful, and we're walking through life, okay? If you're doing what he wants you to do, then it's going to be restful. But there is this thing about we don't live in a vacuum. We walk with people, and there's, there's expectations that can come from every area. We're going to look a little bit at that. But verse 22, bond servants, obey uh, in all things ma your masters according to the flesh. So do, what, you know, do a good job. Not with eye service as men's pleasers. Here he's saying, don't, don't just do it because somebody's watching you. Well, he's saying something specific. Don't, don't just work hard when somebody's watching you. But also, you don't do stuff because of what other people think. We ought to be motivated from the heart to do what he's going to want us to do because if you're doing it for other people that can put a yoke on you that can start to weigh you down verse 23 whatever you do do it heartily as to the lord as to the lord the lord's the one yoked with you and not to men don't do it for people don't do what we do. Don't start to do something based on what somebody else thinks. 
or what you think you should do based on, you know, something you read somewhere. Thank God for books. Books can help us. But something that helps somebody else and got them to a certain place isn't necessarily the formula to get you to where you need to go in the God's plan for your life as you get it from him as you're yoked with him. You can't just take, some, even if they got it from God, the steps that they did are not necessarily the steps that you need to do because you are walking a different plan than other people. So even if it was from God for them, it doesn't mean it's from God for you. Because we all have a different call. We all have a different plan and purpose. And if you try to do what God has told somebody else to do, that's not your yoke. You're, he, they, God is, it, even if they're legit, some, they're following God. That is their call. They're yoked with Jesus, and he's saying, we're going this way. But for you, you're going, you know, God's God, and he can be all places at, at once, and so he is with you, but you're over here. And now if you try to go over here and, and take the expectations and take um, the formula from somebody else, you, that's not your yoke. Yes. Well, if it's not God's yoke for you, it's not going to be light and restful. Now, it may be light and restful for this guy because he's actually hooked with the Lord for him. But we may not if we're trying to take somebody else's. Doesn't mean we can't learn from somebody else. Here's the thing. Whatever, if you can hear what somebody else says, number one, we want to be led by Scripture and the Holy Spirit. But yes, you read something. There's a lot of good books, people... Uh, speak into your life. What you're looking for is a quickening on the inside that the Lord's telling you, yep, that applies to you specifically. We're, of course, the whole word applies to us. We're saying what somebody else is saying. The word applies to you, but somebody's way of doing or applying something doesn't necessarily apply to you. But it can. How are you going to know? You got to be led by the Spirit. If you're led by the Spirit, you'll say, oh yeah, nine of those things, good for you, not for me. But that thing, that's just something I need to apply. Something, something else here. Man, three out of the five, they are applying to me. Those other two, no. And you, you, God can help you through people. But you can't take... See, some people are looking for a shortcut. Just tell me how to do it. Let me read your book. I'll do your steps, and then I don't have to seek God for my own life. You're going to get caught up in yokes that aren't you. You're going to be weighted. I remember a certain minister saying, you know, she, she just got to the point where everything she read, everything she heard became a law to her. She was just like, oh, you're doing that. I got to do that. You're doing that. I got to do that. Okay, you're reading that. And it just became this mountain of pressure. Anybody ever felt something similar to that? Well, that's because we're taking somebody else's yoke. We're not taking the Lord's yoke. What is he actually telling us? Well, you won't be in rest. It'll, be, it'll start to crush you. Well, we don't need that. <laughs> Anybody need that? I don't need that. No, we don't need that. We need to do what the Lord would tell us to do. He's our example. No person, no person is supposed to take the place of God in our life. Look at uh, Matthew 22, verse 34. Skip down a couple there and we'll come back. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him, asked Jesus a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love who? The Lord your God. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. Well, okay, the first one is love God, follow God. He's number one. What he's telling you to do is what we're supposed to do. Yes, you love your neighbor as yourself, but they don't dictate what you do. And it doesn't matter who they are in relation to you. Okay, if you're in a house and you have parents, you're under their authority while you're in that household, but you still have a call on your life, and your mom or your dad cannot call you, cannot tell you what to do. As far as what you're supposed to do in life, 
a, a person does not dictate that. You see the examples of this all the time. You know, that there may be a very prominent figure, and then their children may or may not walk in their footsteps. Yeah. You know, you see it in sports, you see it in different industries where, uh, you know, the, the, the parent was internationally known. Child may or may not, could, could put all the work in and whatever, but, and could be good, but uh, may or may not actually do that. And sometimes, just naturally speaking, people are pressured into doing what they think they ought to do because their family's doing it, when actually they were, they were really supposed to do something else. Well, God's the only one that calls but to the ministry, to every area. And he's the one that's going to quit because, see, with whatever you're yoked up with, there's going to be the equipment to do that. If you try to do something with somebody else does, you're not graced to do it. And so, yes, you, there's, if you're in a house, you're growing up, you have parents, yeah, they're helping to guide you. Ultimately, what they should be doing, our parents, and then we as parents, what we ought to do for our children is we are helping our children to have the foundation to be able to walk with God and ultimately to hear God for themselves because we ain't going to be there the whole, their whole life. I mean, if Jesus doesn't come back, the way it should go is we leave the earth first. And before we ever leave the earth, we've left that position of intimately directing them and guiding them. Because when they step out on their own, you know, when they start doing their own things, you're not, as a parent, we're not supposed to be just telling them what to do all the time. They have their own household. So what do you do? You got to, you, our job is to instill in them a foundation to hear God, to follow God for themselves and to do what God's called them to do. So it's no, nobody specifically in our life should take the place of God to, to uh, be following what somebody else said, regardless of their relationship to us, is a recipe for us to take on burdens that we shouldn't take on, to get involved in things that we're not graced to do, and ultimately to be just miserable. Now look at this scripture in Luke 14. Verse 25. It says, Now great multitudes went with him, Jesus. Then he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me, now we'll clarify this, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now at the last part, he's saying, bear a cross. Well, you're, that's your yoke, doing what you're called to do. But notice it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, he can't follow me closely. Well, does Jesus actually mean hate? That would contradict a lot of scripture. You, you know, love your enemies, but now hate everybody in your household. No, that's not what he's saying. Look at the Amplified Classic. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother in the sense of indifference to and relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God. Does that make sense? And likewise, his wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Let's read that again. If anyone comes to me, God, and does not hate his own father and mother in the sense, and then he says, um, wife, children, brothers and sisters, in the sense of indifference to and relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God, then he can't be my disciple in his own life. What he's saying is, the, your relationship to God has got to be so much higher and uh, directing your life. It's got to be so much greater than your relationship with any other human being. Do you have a close relationship with your spouse? Yes, of course. Do you have a close relationship with your children? Yes. Do you love them? And your spouse? Yes. But they can't start leading you. They can't. You can't look to them to start be, or expectations. And of course, in a family, you ought to be joined. So it ought to be, it does, these are not mutually exclusive. You ought to be with your spouse. They're, they're helping you fulfill the plan. I thank God that I have a, a lovely wife and helpmate that helps me to fulfill the plan of God for my life and vice versa, that we're, 
we're yoked together with Jesus. We're going the same direction. It'd be stupid for us to be, you know, trying to go in different directions, thinking God's leading her one way and me another way. That's just not even, that wouldn't make any sense. If you, you put, apply that to animals plowing a field, that would be just dumb. If you're trying to get a job done, but you're pulling in option, opposite directions, well, no, as a family, we're supposed to be yoked. But this is saying you can't, you, you've got to go to God and you've got to walk with him and not let people influence. And we're talking about in the relation, you, know, you could talk about this in so many areas, but in the context we're talking about is rest. And, and just enjoying Yes, enjoying, that's the, bio, the, the verse we read, that you actually have recreation and quiet and ease and refreshment. You know, you're, you're blessed that you're enjoying life, that you're at rest with life, you're enjoying what you're doing, because you're not trying to do what somebody else told you you're supposed to do, or some idea you got from somebody. In other words, you're not living to other people's expectations. You're pleasing God. Because then you'll have rest. You're, 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 hooked, you're hooked with the yoke that's going to give you rest. And that's the one you're responsible for. You're not responsible for the person on TV. You're not responsible for so, you know your relative. You're not responsible for somebody that was at Bible school. You're responsible for the yoke that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to lead you in, and that will lead to being restful. Period. And if it's not... At so, somehow we've taken another yoke on us. And this is subtle. We can't, we got to watch it. Did God tell me to do it? Did God tell me? Is he leading me here? Is this what he's telling me to do? We got to, we have to ask ourselves uh, these questions because especially if we're, if we're feeling stressed and just overburdened, are we yoked with Jesus or not? Because if, if we are, it should be restful. So we aren't, um, we aren't obligated to do what other people ask us or want us to do. Did you hear me? We're not obligated. We're obligated. You know, we read in Colossians, you're supposed to do it as unto the Lord. Did he tell me to do it? And you can't substitute what other people want or expect or you think they expect with what he wants and expects. We have to be led by the Spirit, not other people's expectations. If you start substituting, well, uh, you know, other people's expectations for that, for being led, then it's a sure uh, path to trouble because, well, somebody wants me to do it, so, you know, I'm a good Christian, so I'll do it. Well, what if it's just a selfish motivation on their part? What if it's not God's timing on their part? Well, now you just substituted somebody else's uh, desire for the Spirit's leading. You open yourself up to all kinds of leadings when we do that. And we're not, we're not accountable for what somebody else wants us to do. We're accountable to what the Lord would have us to do. Does he give us directions in the, the word of God for dealing in life and dealing with people? Yes, we're supposed to love people. That doesn't mean do everything they want us to do. It doesn't say that. Jesus himself didn't do that. He didn't just do what everybody wanted him to do. You know, somebody said, uh, there's, a, there's a quote from a famous person, he, uh, she said, if you always do what interests you, at least one person's pleased. In the natural, you know, I'm talking about naturally. If you just do, you know, at least, because you do what you think everybody else wants to do, they're not happy anyway. And so this is just naturally speaking, well, at least you're pleased. You'll do what you want to do. Well, as a Christian, we're not just supposed to do even what we want to do. You could, you could change this quote. That's why I'm not saying who said it. You may know. But it doesn't matter. Uh, for a Christian, what are we supposed to do? Do what the Lord would have you to do, and then you'll be pleasing Him. And do you notice what it said when we read? We don't have to turn back there, but in Luke uh, 14, it said, you have to, uh, not just with other people, but you have to separate what you want. If you're truly following God, it's not going to always be what you want. 
well, I'm just going to do whatever I want and forget all these other people. No, that's not Christian. That's not following Jesus either. You, when you're yoked with him, you're doing what he wants, which means I'm not doing what I want to do all the time. Yeah. And somebody said it like this. I don't do, you know, minister I respect. I don't do what I want to do all the time. Why would I do what you want me to do? And if you walk with God, that's the way it is. You do what he wants you to do. You don't do what you want to do. You're certainly not going to do what everybody else wants you to do. No, that's just being led by desire. It can open you up to being led by all kinds of things. Look at, look at, look at a few examples of this. Look at uh, John 21, verse 20. So Peter... It says, then Peter, this is after the resurrection, this is um, Jesus talking to a few of his disciples. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. So this is written in John. This is John's gospel. John refers to himself as the disciple who, whom Jesus loved. So he's, you know, that's how he's referring to himself. So he's writing this. And so basically Peter is saying uh, that he's talking, it says, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, which John's saying, he saw me. He saw John, is what he's saying. He could, if you were saying, you know, Peter turned around and saw me, but that's not the way he says it. He says, saw the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, following. So then Peter turned around, saw John, following, who also had leaned on his breast uh, at the supper. Say, and he, so he's saying, the same one, even though he's talking about himself, the same guy that was, you know, leaning up against Jesus at the Last Supper. What he could have said is, Peter saw me, you know, I was the same guy that was with Jesus on the night. That, but this is the way he said it. So, who also had leaned on his breast at supper, saying, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So basically, the sum of that sentence is, Peter saw John. Verse 21, Peter, seeing him, seeing John, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? What about John? Ask Jesus this. What about him? Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. What did he just say? None of your business. You follow me. Well, that's a good uh, pattern for us. You know, what about this dude? Doesn't matter. What if they're asking that about you? This is Jesus' answer to them. What, 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 what if, you know, somebody's asking, well, they should be doing this. What's Jesus' answer? None of your concern, you follow me, I'll deal with them. So we don't have to go around, well, what if they think this of me? What if they think this? It doesn't matter. We have what the Lord said when that question was asked. So we can just get that out of our understanding and not worry about that. Let's look at Luke 10, 38. This can be really freeing, which <laughs> we're talking about rest, right? You, you, you could be really like, okay, ah, and you have ammo. God's not expecting you to do what everybody else wants you to do. That's freeing. Because sometimes we can think, well, of course. Yeah, I'll do all this. No. We're supposed to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? And push everything aside. Now look at this one. We've used this before, but I want you to see something specific here. Never used it quite like this before, this illustration. But we're going to look at a, uh, this in another example uh, of Jesus not doing what people wanted him to do. You know, Jesus didn't just go do everything everybody wanted him to do. Jesus walked on the earth. He only had so much time. He's walking as the answer to everything. But he didn't just go do everything everybody wanted him to do all the time. He did what the Father led him to do. He walked perfectly led by the Spirit and always did what he was supposed to. And he's our pattern. Because we are, you know, Christians, some, you can get this worldly idea, religious idea, that means you're just supposed to do everything everybody wants you to do all the time because that's what you do. You will be worn out, you'll be stressed out, you'll not be restful, you'll be out of the will of God, and God never gave us that pattern to do. Yes, we're supposed to serve others. That doesn't mean at everybody's whim. It doesn't mean 24-7. You can't possibly do that. So how are you going to know what to do? You've got to be led. Luke 10, 38. It says, Now it happened as they went, 
as they went, that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that, that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So we use this in, um, I've used it. It, it, you can definitely talk about, Mary, Martha's worried about a lot of stuff, and um, Mary's chosen just to sit at the feet of Jesus. But look back at um, verse 40, Martha was distracted with much serving. Okay, she's distracted with doing something, and she approached Jesus. Now, Jesus, he's the Lord of, you know, I mean, he hasn't gone to the cross yet, but they're, they're following after him of Martha and Mary. Mary is listening to Jesus. Mary is doing what she believes she should do. She's just peacefully sitting at his feet. Martha comes up. And says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Who is she telling that to? Jesus. She's telling Jesus what to do. She's actually coming up and telling Jesus to tell Mary what to do. In other words, she's coming up and thinking she knows the will of God and the plan of God for Mary. But Mary has no obligation to do what Martha wants her to do. Martha is worried about a lot of stuff. And she is letting that spill over and now trying to direct Mary's life. And she's going to God, but Mary's right there. So... If, number one, Jesus was led by what somebody wanted him to do, he would be being led by Martha, who is worried and distracted. Do you see that? Martha's worried and distracted. She's in no place to be leading anybody. Jesus didn't listen to her. Jesus didn't say, oh, well, I guess you, you think we should do that. All right, Mary, get up and help her. We're done. And Mary did not need to be taking direction for Martha. Through Jesus, notice Jesus didn't do it. Jesus did not direct Mary to do something different. So we're talking about rest and we're talking about us following plan, the plan of God. Well, if you can use it in two ways here. Number one, Jesus, as our example, didn't just listen to somebody else and do what they said. Number two, Mary is following Jesus. Somebody else comes on the side. This is a lot like what Jesus told Peter, none of your business didn't interfere. We're, if we're going to follow God like Mary is, we don't have to worry about, in this case, Martha's a good woman, I believe, hardworking woman, but in this case, we don't have to worry about the Peters or the Marthas in this context trying to get in and say, what about them? We need to say, what does God want us to do? And if somebody's distracted or uptight, that's their problem, and they're going to have to deal with God, and it's not our, our job to please them. Because that'll lead us to... Oh, Martha's freaked out. I guess I should be freaked out too. Well, then we're not helping anybody then, right? Let's look at uh, John 11, verse 1. We'll look at this example, and then uh, we'll just run through a few. We're not going to look at this whole thing. This is about the account of Lazarus, and you can read the whole chapter on your own. I just uh, pulled out a few verses so that we could know, um, we could follow along and, and key in on some, on some few incidents, but we're not going to take time to read the whole thing. Verse 1 says, Now a certain ma a sick man, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister, Mount, uh, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped her, his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So this is the, her, their brother now. Their brother is sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So Lazarus is sick, sick, and an implication, come. So he's sick. You need to come. 
That's what they're telling Jesus. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, the sickness is, this sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Not saying God sent the sickness to uh, glorify him. Notice, he's saying, this isn't going to end in death. I mean, it did, but it's not ultimately going there, and it's going to glorify God. And if somebody says, well, sickness, see, there's a scripture that says, sickness glorifies God. Lazarus got healed, raised from the dead. And healed. So, no, having the sickness is not what glorified God. It's the fact that he got healed. More than healed. You had to be raised from the dead and then healed. If you weren't, ra if you weren't healed and you are raised from the dead, you'd die again right away. So he was healed too. <laughs> He'd just come back to life and pff, the thing would kill him again. He had to be healed. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. Lazarus. Did he love them? Yes. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. <laughs> what would we say? Oh, you love it. If you love me, you should be there. If you love me, you need to come. It's, it's urgent. Is, is this urgent? We know from then and we know he's going to die. Did Jesus go? No. He didn't go. Now we're talking about rest. What if Jesus goes... Oh, well, I'll drop whatever I'm doing. I got to get there. Would that have been the will of God for Jesus? Question, did Jesus always follow the will of God, the Father? Yeah. Yes. So was this God's will for him to be right where he was? So it was not God's will for him to drop everything and go to Lazarus. So you cannot determine the will of God by what somebody wants you to do, expects you to do, thinks you should do with your life or any given incident. You will be stressed and you will allow stress to get in your life because somebody else is stressed. And because they're stressed, they're putting that stress, trying to put that stress on you. And we just need to be like, don't have to be mean. Jesus saying he loved them, but no. We're not going to let that stress become our stress because we're going to walk with the Lord and his yoke. And his, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. And we're going to stay there. So he just kept doing the will of the Father, even though pressure... Why don't you come? Prove you love them. Then he said, to, after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Okay, skip down to verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. So by the time he got there, Lazarus is dead for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Verse 20, Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you would have been here, what's, I mean, there's a little implication there. You should have been here. Did Jesus miss it? He didn't miss it. But this is, this, is a, this is pressure. This is expectation. Why didn't you come? Should have came. Jesus didn't. Jesus was led. We're talking about other people's expectation. We need to follow God. That doesn't mean we need to be abrasive and mean. But we have to follow what God has told, not just in individual things, but for our life. What do we need to do? What God has asked us and told us to do. And you stay true to him and you stay yoked with him. So, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Let's skip down to verse um, 32. John 11, verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, so Jesus... It, she heard Jesus is calling for her, and so then she's coming. That's what it said earlier. Uh, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary said, came, and you know, I believe she's, she's coming, and she sat down at his feet like she does, and just like, Lord, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came uh, with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? And then, he, then they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then Jesus said, 
or they, the Jews said, how, see how much he loved him. In verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? See, more, why didn't he come? Couldn't he have stopped it? Why didn't he do it? What are those things? They're, they're questioning their expectation. They are uh, second guessing. What are we called to do as Christians? Who are we to follow? The Lord God. Everything we do is supposed to be after Him. And so we do everything unto Him, not for the expectations of people just out there, not for the expectations of even our close loved ones. We've got to follow Him. And then as we do that, the rest is going to be there because we're responsible for doing what he said and nothing else. And as we, if we'll shun that, that the other people's expectations, not again, not abrasively, not unlovingly, but if we'll put that aside and we'll just look to him and say, Lord, I'm going to do what you call me to do. Not always easy, questioning, things like that, but we'll do that. Then there's going to be a rest. There's going to be an unburdening. And if we understand that that's all we're expected to do is what he's asking us to do, not what somebody else is asking us to do, it will be freeing, it will be resting, it will actually be refreshing to us. And the more we can do that, then the more we're going to be doing what he actually wants us to do, joyful while we're doing it, and actually being a blessing more so to the people around us because what he wants us to do is ultimately the exact right plan. People may think they know, people may a second guess, but what he wants us to do is actually right, and when the dust settles, just like in this last example, just like another example with Mary and Martha, it will be shown that God was right, and us following him is actually the best thing we could do for everyone.